Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Freedom Project Academy, where we're going to have an overview of my book, To the Victor Go the Myths and Monuments. Now, a lot of people are going to be very shocked about some of the things that are in this book if they've never been exposed to this sort of thing before. Uh, you know, when I went to school, I thought I knew history. You know, I studied history because I wanted to study history. I really liked it. I read a lot of books outside of the normal genre that we got in school and uh, learned a lot of things that I didn't learn in school, but nothing compared to what I learned after I got out of school. And it really all started uh, when I was in an automobile with uh, four other men. We were on our way to a speech. And uh, the fellow that I knew the best in the car, in the back seat, said, you know, we'd, my state, he was from Arkansas, just paid off its war bonds. And I thought, well, what's that got to do with anything? But I asked him, because I obviously wanted to be asked, uh, what do you mean war bonds from Korea? He said, no. I said, from the Second World War? No. Well, when did you buy these war bonds, your state? He said, the Civil War. It had been a hundred years, and I did not realize that the North had forced the Southern states to buy bonds to pay for the war. And it took them a hundred years to pay it off. Not a well-known fact. And so I said to myself, what is it that I don't know about this conflict? And so I started to look at it closer. And the more I looked, it more it led me further back in time, not just to the Civil War, but what caused the war, who caused the war, what organizations were involved, so on and so forth. And I discovered that what I learned in school, quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, was a myth. And the reasons for the war and the conflict, I began to understand, were done by a particular group of individuals and organizations imported from Europe specifically to bring about a war. And I don't know about you, but when I go to events and I, and I come home and look at my newspaper or turn on the television, and what I see is not the same event that I was at. <laughs> they don't quite report it that way. Now, there are some reasons for that. For instance, in an automobile accident, you have two witnesses and, and they're on either side of the street. So one sees the accident from that side, another sees the accident from that side, and they both have a different view. And so sometimes it doesn't look as though they've actually seen the same accident. And that is part of the reason why you get a difference of opinion about certain events. Others, they will look at it based on their education or lack of education. Uh, for instance, if a cub reporter is there and he doesn't quite or she doesn't quite understand the uh, candidate, for instance, who's speaking, uh, because they don't have enough background to understand what they're saying, they can skew the whole news story. But then there's a third reason. And the third reason is this. Some of them are deliberately skewing what happened, deliberately skewing what the candidate or the party or the organization stands for, said, so on and so forth. Uh, my experience, for instance, in infiltrating Marxist organizations when I was a very young man showed me that on many occasions these people infiltrate into the newspapers, into the TV studios, and I could give you names and so on and so forth. But just as a, a quick for instance, and you can look this up online when you get home, and, and I actually encourage everybody to get out pencil, pencil and paper and write some of this stuff down if you don't believe it. Or if I throw a name at you, you can go online and look it up. But I knew a young man, for instance, who was the leader in the 1960s of the Young Socialist Alliance, was, was a very militant organization that got people out in the streets that turned into riots in the city of Seattle. When he graduated, and his, by the way, his father was the head of the Socialist Workers Party, which was the Leon Trotsky branch of the communist movement. Leon Trotsky was the uh, rival of Joseph Stalin in communist Russia, and he got kicked out by Stalin, ultimately murdered by one of Stalin's agents in Mexico. They formed the Socialist Workers Party. This man's father was the head of the Washington State Socialist Workers Party. When he graduated from the University of Washington, he went to work for the Seattle Post-Intelligencer as a reporter. And soon 
became the city editor. Now, do you think he might have been a little bit biased in his reporting and his editing? Of course. But that soon became too boring for him, apparently, because he went on to bigger things. And instead of in the streets or in the newspapers, he went on to become a leader in the environmental movement. The man's name is Mark Krasnowski. You can look him up online. I don't know how much of his early career it has, but if anybody's in doubt, I can show you press clippings and everything else. Uh, I can even show you his signature on, on papers saying that he was a member of the Socialist Workers Party. So it's very interesting. So you have those three things that may happen, you see. It's also the same when it comes to history. There are those that look at it from a different angle, those that look at it based on their education, and there are, there are those that actually do change history in the history books. They deliberately obfuscate and lie about what history really was. And so going back into history and starting to look and following all these rabbit holes and chasing the rabbits down them, I began to put a, a pattern together of early American history that I had never learned, nor had I found anyone else who had learned it. And that was the beginning of a 45 year time span of looking up facts and putting it into uh, my book, To the Victor, Go the Myths and Monuments. And today what we are witnessing is this, a growing distrust of the media. I mean, everybody today is complaining about it. It's so lopsided, it's just incredible, particularly this campaign. Regardless of what you think of the candidates, it's obvious which side the media is on, isn't, isn't it, really? Now, this has always been a problem. Uh, most people think that, well, this only is modern, uh, that it's always Roosevelt, oh, it was Wilson, oh, it was this, oh, it was that. It has always been a problem in the history of the United States. There's been a bias within a certain segment of the media. In those days, of course, the media was exclusively the press. And so uh, about 10% of the newspapers uh, uh, in the time frame of the ratification of the Constitution were actually on the left, what we would say were leftists. Actually, they were Jacobin, and we'll get into that in a moment. Now, we all recognize the fact that individuals and movements have wanted to rule the people. I mean, you know, whether you're looking at Hitler or Stalin or Mao or Saddam Hussein or anybody else, we know these people want to rule others. Now, how do they get into that position where they wield that kind of power? Are you telling me that a street urchin like uh, Hitler, a, a low-level thug in the communist movement by Stalin, and Mao Zedong, uh, who was really nobody, were able to put people together to such an extent to propel them into absolute power that they did this on their own? One man? Of course not. See, there's organization behind these people, and they always hide the organization. They put the leader out front, but nobody thinks about the organization behind it. And how come these people are successful? And this organization, people pretty much recognize, came out of an or, uh, a group, a small group of people at Ingolstadt University on May 1st, 1776. And the founder was Adam Weishaupt with just a small number of students of his. And from there, they propelled themselves into a level of influence. Now, one of the problems that we have when we're talking about the Illuminati is this. First of all, the Illuminati is a fact. This is undeniable. There's no one that contests that. What is contested is how much power did they have? How much influence did they have? How many members did they have? How well were they organized? And when did they go out of existence? You see, because every history book that you read tells you that the Illuminati went out of existence immediately after its, its uh, being discovered by the government of Bavaria. And it was interesting, by the way, the way they discovered the Illuminati was totally secret. And in those days, you didn't have mail service like we have today. You know, we just stick the mail in the slot and we know somebody's going to come along and pick it up. And, and in Timbuktu, they're going to get my letter, right? Well, this isn't the way it was back in the, in the 1700s. Particularly if you had uh, really confidential correspondence, you hired a messenger. 
or someone, some friend, some family member, someone you bought, bought, went out and delivered your package, your letter, correspondence, documents, whatever it was. And they had this Illuminist carrying these documents between key leaders in the Illuminati. Guess what? As he was approaching Ingolstadt University, lo and behold, a bolt of lightning came down and killed him on, this, on his horse. It was an act of God. And when the authorities got there and opened up the papers that he had on them, they said, wait, wait a minute, what is this? These people are talking about taking over governments and killing people and developing poisons to, and, and all of that sort of thing. What, what is this all about? So they found the, some of the members because of these papers and started to interrogate them. And they discovered what the goals of the Illuminati were. And uh, so before we get to the goals, let's talk about society in general, because as a society exists, they form their own government, do they not? Every society forms its own government and maintains that government as they wish, based on their culture and religion and so on and so forth. In their geography, whatever, and all things that enter into that society, they form a government. We formed a government here with the 13 colonies, didn't we? Based on our culture, based on our religious background, etc. And that's the case it is all over the world, no matter whether it's a, a, a free government like ours or, or less free in, in many, in most cases. And so society determines your form of government. Now, if you change that society, you automatically change the government within a certain amount of time. It just is an automatic result. That's why immigration, mass immigration called migration, anytime that's ever happened, there's no time in history when that didn't change the society and the government into which they migrated. No exceptions. That is one of the problems of what's going on in our country today, is they're changing our society. That will ultimately change our system of government. Can't be helped. And Karl Marx knew this. If you read the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, they state in there, that they want a social revolution. They don't say revolution. You know, we think that they want a revolution. They're going to go in the street and they're going to kill a few people and they're going to establish this new government. They know they can't establish a new government unless they change the society. Now, if they don't change the society enough, what do they do? They eliminate part of the society, like Cambodia. They took whole cities, literally cities, not little towns, not little villages, whole cities in Cambodia and marched them out into the killing fields and slaughtered them all because they knew they couldn't change that society without eliminating enough people to do it. You see, they've estimated, uh, for instance, uh, and this is historical fact, that communists have said at least a third of the American people will have to be eliminated in order to make communism work in this country. To get rid of those people that will stand up, who are moral people and won't follow communist orders. Just that simple. But at any rate, getting back to the point, you've got to change society. Marx knew that if they didn't change society, then they could have a counter-revolution in that society, throw the rascals out, and shoot them maybe. I mean, that's what you used to do when you had civil wars and revolutions, right? You shot the loser. I mean, that's, that's the way it was in those days. And so the goal of the Illuminati actually was to change society. Well, how did they propose to do that? So you see the aims of the, of the Illuminati. <clears throat> Excuse me, the overthrow of all government, the destruction of religion. They wanted to get rid of anything that didn't hold allegiance to the state. So they didn't want people believing in God. Didn't matter what the religion was, by the way. They did not want to have the people adhere to a higher authority than the state itself. Get rid of all religion. Abolition of private property. In other words, private property, and this is not taught well in the schools today, is an essential ingredient of a free society. You being able to hang on to the fruits of your labor and not you know, owning your own house or your own farm and, and so on and so forth. And the death of individualism and family. Again, they did not want to have anybody just doing what they darn well pleased. 
you know, and, you know, and, and defying the government. And they didn't want people to adhere to the family. The family is the, really the building block of, of society, isn't it? And you break up that society uh, and, you know, I mean, that family, and you start breaking up society. The deification of sensuality. Do we see that in our country today? The deification of sensuality. Whatever feels good, do it kind of a thing. The repudiation of marriage. They didn't even want people to, to, to be bonded in marriage. And uh, the state control of children. That's why in all of those three cases, these three examples I showed you of Stalin and Hitler and Mao, you go into a classroom in those countries under those rulers, what did you see? You saw a picture of Hitler, Mao, or Stalin up the, at the front of the class, didn't you? And they were required to stand up every day and sing praises to the leader. And that became the substitute for God. Uh, you know, they, and we've seen videos, you can go on, on uh, YouTube and see all sorts of videos of German kids singing the praises of Adolf Hitler and uh, so on and so forth. And in the end, the establishment of a world government to be ruled by the Illuminati at the top. And so these are their, their overall goals to change society, but you can boil them down to two. They have two goals that you should never lose sight of. One is the elimination of God. That is a paramount thing. And two, the building of a, what they call, and this is not a right wing deal, they call it the new world order, a one world government. And so these are the aims of the Illuminati. Now, some of the revolutionaries who were involved in the Illuminati in Europe became very influential on American society. And probably, uh, maybe one of these people, maybe two, you've heard their names, but they are essential in the study of American history as to the influence they had on the fledgling United States. Uh, Filippi uh, Bonarate, uh, who was a close personal friend of, of Weishaupt and tutored by Weishaupt. Krakus Beoff, he, you can trace Hitler and Stalin directly to this guy. Nazism and communism. Uh, Louis August Blanqui, the same thing. Giuseppe Mazzini, who was the leader of, of a wing of the conspiracy called the Carbonari. And uh, Kant de uh, Marabou, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him uh, in a little while. He was a pornographer. Uh, he dealt in pornography in France. And then Nikolai Bonneville, now, Nikolai Bonneville is very interesting. He started the Circle Social, or Social Circle. And the Social Circle had a profound effect on the American uh, people uh, through the various individuals that, uh, that they had run through their organization. Uh, they also uh, formed other organizations. And uh, he was so famous. He was probably the most important member of the Illuminati in France in his lifetime and very instrumental in the French Revolution. A lot of people know that they are in the business of changing words. You know, it's called uh, semantics. And, and they will actually change words to confound and confuse the language and move it towards people thinking the way they want them to think. Let me give you an example in my lifetime. When I was a small boy, when you called somebody square, that was a compliment because you were talking about the four squares of being a good person, you know, responsibility and, and belief in God and all of that, the four, four uh, square. That's what you were. You were a good guy. By the time I was an adult, a square had changed completely to an invective. He was a nerd, right? And so here, good guy, when, and within 15 years, the same word is bad guy. And that has changed a lot of words in our lifetime. Uh, welfare, for instance, and all sorts of things. You can look in the Constitution. The, the meaning of the words has changed completely. And this has been by design. And Nikolai Bonneville in the Circle Social started that process. Interesting thing about Nikolai Bonneville. Nikolai Bonneville, uh, how many here have heard Bonneville Dam, Bonneville Salt Flats, all these things named Bonneville? It's named after his son. And what happened was a man 
who was an American, who was instrumental in the American Revolution, went to England and started to form Illuminist organizations. And he was kicked out of, he had to flee England. He went into France, they made him, keep in mind, this guy is not a Frenchman, okay? He's not a French citizen. They named him a member of the French Revolutionary Assembly, representing the people. And he was a very close friend of Nikolai Bonneville, and he moved in with Nikolai Bonneville. He moved in and lived in his house for over six years. And he slept with his wife. He slept with Bonneville's wife. He was that close. And when uh, the rise of Napoleon came along, who was also an Illuminist, but put in there by the Illuminati, he decided that he wanted to be the leader. This is one of the things that they're always dealing with these people. Every one of them, they're, they're like the mafia, right? Guy rises to the top and the second guy wants to be at the top. So he bumps off the first guy, right? And, and that's the way the mafia works. Well, the Illuminati worked to a great extent like that too. So once Napoleon got in charge in France, he started to outlaw all these Illuminist organizations. Why? Because he knew they could take him out. You see, they always eliminate the people that can get rid of them. Hitler did it with the night, the night of the Long Knives, didn't he? Remember the brown shirt leaders? He was afraid they were going to have a counter-revolution against his revolution, so he killed all the Nazi leaders that, that he feared. And Stalin did it by inventing a war on terror. There was no terrorism in Russia. They just perpetuated a couple of things, made it look like terrorism, and that way he could get rid of all of his opponents and rivals, guys that he feared could take over. Saddam Hussein did it the first week. Saddam Hussein, after he came to power in Iraq, got all the Ba'ath Party leaders together and said, now I want you to go out and shoot him, and I want you to go out and shoot him, and so on and so forth, and they had to do it, and they did it. Because they knew if they didn't, it wouldn't just be one dead, it'd be two, right? Both of them. So that's how he struck fear into their hearts and literally took over very, very quickly, uh, totally. But at any rate, this guy, uh, is when Robespierre became the head of the French government, beheading all those people, you know, the reign of terror, he imprisoned this man, this American. No one ever knows how he escaped with his life, but he did. And he came back to America, and Bonneville asked him to take his wife and kids to America because he thought he was going to be arrested and killed by Napoleon. So this man brought these kids and the wife back, and he got the oldest son of Bonneville into West Point, and those are the landmarks that are named after Bonneville, Bonneville's son. The man, the American who did this, who was a member of the Illuminati, was a fellow that all of us know, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a member of the Illuminati wrote a great thing called Common Sense. After that, you can throw all the rest of it away. Most of Thomas Paine's writings after that are used as primers by the communist movement to take people who are basically American in their thinking into rationalism and away from God and building big government. Uh, at any rate. Now, the Jacobin movement was imported to America from France, revolutionary France. These Illuminist agents came to the United States trying to take over America during Washington and Adams administrations. And uh, they were controlled by the Illuminati. Now, the interesting thing is, now you can find this out if you look hard enough online. It got so bad that when Philadelphia was the capital of the United States before they built Washington, D.C., it's so about 27, 28,000 people lived there. They had a riot of 10,000 people in the streets looking for George Washington to hang him. Now, did you read that in your history book? I sure didn't. But it's there. It's a fact. In fact, Adams, later on, John Adams, when he recounseled with Thomas Jefferson, because they had a falling out there for about a decade or more, Adams wrote Jefferson and said, the only thing that I think saved the United States in that time period was a yellow fever epidemic that hit Philadelphia. And so everybody stayed home. They didn't want to riot anymore. They went home, closed the shutters on their house, stayed inside, and the outside agitators, and there were a lot of them, came into town 
uh, as part of this movement, they didn't want to go to Philadelphia anymore and catch the yellow fever. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 Benjamin Franklin's grandson died of yellow fever. Uh, he was the editor of the Aurora newspaper, which was a Jacobin uh, newspaper. By the way, this movement, the Jacobin movement, evolved into the Democrat Party. It's just that simple. Uh, whether you like it or not, look at history, go back and study it. That's the way it is. At the same time, we had a Rosicrucian influence on America. The Rosicrucians is a secret society that's very, very difficult to research. It is probably one of the most secretive of, of those that are known. And uh, I've read all their books that I could get my hands on. And they always say the same things relative to who their leaders were down through the ages. Uh, for instance, they had a council of three. This is a worldwide council of three, mainly confined basically to, to uh, Western Europe in, in all uh, respects. And the leaders of the council of uh, three, and wait for this one, Benjamin Franklin, George Clymer, and Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine, when he left and came to the United States, he was replaced and on the Council of Three by Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette probably belonged to more secret societies and revolutionary organizations than anybody, than perhaps Albert Pike, for those of you who, who know that name. Uh, it kind of went into a hiatus. These men all died and they kind of, you know, disappeared, so to speak. And uh, the second Council of Three was revived uh, just before the Civil War. And the individuals who belonged on that was Pascal Beverly Randolph and uh, General Ethan uh, Hitchcock, who was at one time the Commandant at West Point, uh, George Lepard. And George Lepard was a young author, and he wrote a lot of books on history. And they were all fiction. But they were so popular, and he wrote them so well, that people actually took some of those fictional accounts and actually started putting them in history books to where these history books were talking about this guy's fiction instead of the real thing. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the Liberty Bell, for instance, that when they first rang the Liberty Bell, it cracked when they read the, the Constitution of the United States. Now, that's not true at all. But at any rate, he died young, and he was replaced by an obscure attorney out in Springfield, Illinois, by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And so these were the Rosicrucian leaders who had, by the way, moved to the United States. You see, they moved out of Western Europe and moved the Rosicrucian headquarters to the United States. So all these individuals were Americans, you see. Uh, and that happened a lot. <clears throat> and by the way, you can look it up, and no historian debates this, that the uh, Humanidad Lodge in Paris was a Rosicrucian lodge, and the leaders there uh, included Franklin and Lafayette. No debate on that whatsoever by historians. Now, there was a tremendous amount of Illuminati uh, influence through institutions on the government and in our society. Uh, for instance, I'm just going to cover a couple of them because there's so many and we haven't got the time. But once the Bavarian government had outlawed the Illuminati, Weishaupt had to flee north, and he went north into Göttingen University and was a professor there with a number of other members of the Illuminati. In fact, out of that institution comes all of the racial prejudices of Adolf Hitler. You can trace all that hate the Jews, the, the Slavs, all the rest of it comes right out of that university in a direct line to the Nazi party. And out of that uh, instruction there came individuals like George Bancroft. Now George Bancroft, right after he got his doctorate there, founded Round Hill School, and it became a preparatory school for Harvard. Harvard actually financed it, but he put it together and he ran it. And he had like-minded individuals become part of the faculty of Round Hill School. He went on to become the Secretary of Navy. And as Secretary of Navy, he started the Annapolis Naval Academy without the permission of the executive branch or, uh, although he was part of the executive branch, or the Congress. He just started it. 
and, and like a lot of things that executives do, Congress kind of, uh, you know, goes along with it. Now, you can argue that the, the merits of doing that. We can all say Annapolis is great, it's wonderful. We need training for our young Navy uh, cadets so they can go on and be great admirals and, and win wars for us and protect our shores and all that. But it was done illegally, basically. And uh, anyway, he was behind it. The other thing is that there were other individuals who were involved in this process out of Gooding. And in fact, Edward Everett was the first American to be awarded a doctorate from Gooding University. Now, Edward Everett was a very prominent man. You probably know him because he delivered the Gettysburg Address. Now, I know you think Lincoln did, but the actual address was delivered by Edward Everett for about an hour and a half, and Mr. Lincoln stood up and gave this short little uh, dissertation off some notes he made that we think of as today as the Gettysburg Address. But he was not the main speaker. Edward Everett was. And Edward Everett, right after he left Goodingen, the first thing he did when he came back to the United States was to ed educate Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, his entire life, was involved in the socialist movement and very much a revolutionary. Now, he wrote some very good poetry. I like his poetry, frankly. I've been to that bridge at Concord where the, the shot that was heard around the world, where they actually stood up to the British Army from crossing that bridge. There's that Minuteman statue, and on that statue is that poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson that's so stirring uh, regarding the uh, individuals that stood up to the British at that time. But we know that politicians say one thing. It uh, doesn't mean they always do what they say. And that a lot was uh, Emerson. Now, I was taught in school, he was a great poet and all that, Thoreau and these guys, they were great Americans and so on, but they were all socialists. At any rate, a couple of things happened uh, in, in Europe when the Illuminati was discovered. They developed a tactic that was, that was um, uh, given to them by Weishaupt, that when they get discovered, they are to dive down and then come up into the surface again under a new name with different leaders, but it's actually still the same organization. And they've done this time after time after time. Most people don't even know that the name of the Illuminati wasn't their original name. It was the Perfectionableists. Hard to say. So they changed their name to Illuminati. But at any rate, uh, what they did was this. They formed something, a network called the German Union. And this German Union was designed to help people, supposedly, uh, with being able to get reading materials and books, magazines, that kind of thing. Because in those days, books and magazines were pretty expensive. Sure, the printing press had come along, but it was still very expensive. So what they would do, they would have a little group, say, in a, in a small town, and they would uh, pool their money to get this magazine subscription or this book and then they would pass it around. Well, they had nearly 500 of those societies in the German Confederation. And as a result, they started to control what magazines could stay in business, what publishers could stay in business, because they wouldn't order the books that they didn't want out there. They would order the books that were written and the magazines published by their own minions. And so over a period of time, over many, many years, they started to influence the thinking of, of the German people. By the time Hitler came along, they were all prepared. But at any rate, that's what they did in Germany. In the United States, they copied the same thing into American literary societies like the Bird Club, Radical Club, Atlantic Club, Saturday Club. And they started to, to promote themselves. That's literally what they did. The Emersons and the Longfellows and the Whittiers and the Thoreaus all belonged to these societies and they promoted their own writings. They formed their own magazines and shut everybody else out. See, because I as an intellectual am an individualist, right? I'm out there writing and, and uh, that sort of thing. I'm not part of any organization. I'm just trying to get my viewpoint across, you see. Well, that doesn't work when you've got all these individuals organized to capture the publishing houses and deny me access 
to these magazines and publications and everything else. There were a lot of good writers and, and as such in those days. You've never heard of them because they were shut out. Individuals just want to do their individualism. These guys were organized. They not only took over the publishing houses, they not only took over the magazines and started them and the newspapers, they actually started to go into the Christian publishing houses. And the main thing they did there was this. They tried to convince Christians of two things. Being a, socialism, uh, being a socialist was really the word of God. In other words, you know, sharing alike and all that, all this charity business, only it's government charity instead of individual charity. They convinced Christians that that was the way to go. But more important than anything, the thing that they did was to convince Christians not to get involved. In other words, don't get involved in this. Uh, you know, do nothing. They wouldn't change any of the scripture. They wouldn't change the Bible. They would just change the mindset of how you read it. In other words, you're, supports, you're supposed to support your leaders. Like, you know, uh, there are many passages in, in scripture that, that say that, except it's taken out of context. Cover to cover, it's what? Oppose evil and the consequences of not opposing evil. But they got Christians to stop opposing evil. And that's all they had to do. What is the chief enemy of these kinds of people? It's, it is the religious people, is it not? So do you think they're going to leave the religious people alone? That they're not going to attack them in a way that they don't even realize they're being attacked, that they're taking over from the inside? It, this has been going on, and that's all I'm going to say of it. I didn't want to get into it in my book because I, I want you to understand what's going on. And once you understand what's going on, you can make up your own mind, right? At any rate, these are communists who influenced American politics. Karl Marx. Now, how did Karl Marx influence American politics? For one thing, he was the, you know, the titular leader of the communist movement. And all the communist aspect that came into the United States was under his leadership at one time. For instance, Wendell Phillips, the famous abolitionist, a member of Congress, Senator Charles Sumner, who was the uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate, uh, and uh, Horace Greeley were all members of the Communist First International under Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote 500 articles for Horace Greeley's newspaper, the New York Tribune, when it was the largest uh, Sunday circulated newspaper in the United States. The Communist movement helped build its circulation for his Sunday edition. Very influential. And he, Horace Greeley hired other communists from Europe to also write as regular columnists in the newspaper. Uh, Robert Dale Owen, who was the son of Robert Owen, uh, Victoria Woodhull. Victoria Woodhull was the head of Section 12 of the Communist uh, International. She and her sister put together the first Wall Street Journal, the very first newspaper that was ever published to keep people abreast of what was going on in Wall Street. And all the main brokerages advertised in her newspaper, and they all knew she was a communist. And Frederick Sorge, or Sergei, he was the leader of the communist uh, apparatus, if you will, uh, organizationally. And where did Sorge come from, and where did he live when he was doing this? He came from Germany into the United States and ran the Communist International from New York City, because Karl Marx and Engels and all these guys moved communist headquarters to New York City in 1872. Look it up. You can find it. You won't find it in the history book you got in school, but you'll find it if you look for it. And so the headquarters of the communist movement has never been Moscow. Where has it been? It's never moved out of New York City. And there's a lot of evidence to that effect. I won't get into it, and I didn't get into it in my book because I stopped at a certain point. Now, one of the things that we've already said is we need to change society, don't we? And if we're going to affect a revolution, we need to change society. How are we going to do that? Well, the best way is war. You use war to change society. Why? Because in the name of the war effort, you'll stand still for almost anything. 
you'll, you'll have increased taxes, increased re regulations, uh, the, the curtailment of your travel, any number of different things uh, in the name of winning the war. One example is the cigarette tax. You know, it, you know, in the name of World War II, they put a tax on cigarettes that didn't exist there before by the federal government. Now, when the war was over, did they get rid of that tax? <laughs> of course they didn't. But there were a lot of other things as well that they didn't get rid of in the name of winning the war, which were regulatory. Uh, they confiscated uh, businesses, uh, all sorts of things like that. But the war has to be on your soil to really make those changes. Can't be a war over there. It's got to be a war here. Terror is another way of affecting change. In the name of terror, in the name of security, in the name of protecting your neighborhood and your home from terrorists that may or may not be there, but you're convinced they are, uh, then you will stand still for limitations on your freedom. You know, uh, we see that, for instance, don't we, with the war on terror today, with their, the uh, government's ability to violate the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, of, of searching your private records and everything else in violation uh, without a war uh, warrant. Economic collapse will do it too. And mass immigration will do it. So the best one though is war. So how do we bring about a war on the United, in the United States? How do we do that? We're not gonna get England or France or, or uh, 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 Spain to invade us. We, we already had that, the last one was the War of 1812. And the, and the English and everybody knew that they couldn't invade the United States. It's just impossible. So they developed a plan to bring about a war inside the United States. We recognize that war today as the Civil War. And uh, you can put any label you want on it, an economic war, a war against slavery, all that. All of these things were used as excuses. Most of the people that brought about the war you can, you can document the fact they hated the Constitution of the United States. They hated the freedom of the American people. The leaders of the anti-slavery abolitionist movement hated the Constitution. They just didn't want to amend the Constitution to get rid of slavery. They wanted to destroy the Constitution, whether it was Phillips, whether it was uh, Garrison, or who the leaders were. And they said so publicly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the reasons why the people that lived at that time were not enthusiastic about eliminating slavery right away because they didn't like what came with it. It wasn't that they were for slavery. They just didn't want to hand leadership over to these people that wanted to get rid of the Constitution in the process. So it was very slow, and, and there was a lot of resistance to this. But the thing that really, finally, uh, turned this thing around was the terrorism that they produced on American soil to get the war started. They used terror to actually start the war. And the individuals that I have listed here are individuals who finance socialist and terrorist cause, they, these industrialists. We have the idea that industrialists, capitalists, are anti-communists. That's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of them that helped the communists over the years because they themselves believed in it. Whether it was Robert Owen, a Scotch uh, industrialist who started communist communes in the United States. Frederick Engels was an industrialist, a partner of Marx. Garrett Smith, who was uh, part of the Astor uh, Empire, uh, John Jacob Astor. Andrew Carnegie had to leave England because of his involvement in the British Car Chartist movement. Chart. Ist. And that's just another name for communist. The Chartist newspaper, The Republican, published the uh, Communist Manifesto, the first ones to publish the Communist Manifesto in England. Andrew Carnegie was a man who was part of this Chartist movement. Cornelius Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt financed that Wall Street Journal that I just talked about. And it wasn't called the Wall Street Journal, but that's what it was. In, in, in fact, and uh, he, because he was sleeping with Woodhull's sister. He, she was his mistress. And so he helped finance these sisters in their communist activities. 
Now, the chief instrument of communist terror, which reacted the South into secession, was John Brown. John Brown was a communist, according to his son, okay? Now, you won't read that in your, in your history books. But what happened with John Brown was he created such a reaction in the South because of Harper's Ferry that the Southerners were scared to death. In 1850, they had a secessionist uh, convention in the South, and they didn't secede because they weren't ready to secede. But after John Brown, they were because it showed them, amongst other things, that the Northerners, in their eyes, were ready to kill them all. I mean, literally. And, uh, and so John Brown was used to create that condition. And the terrorist John Brown was helped by individuals who can trace their organizations directly to the Illuminati through the First International, like Sumner and Phillips and Greeley. Alan Pinkerton, you know, remember him? He's the guy that helped start the Secret Service in the United States. He was the guy that, that formed the Pinkerton Detective Agency using the all-seeing eye as his emblem. In fact, the all-seeing eye of his emblem led to the uh, slogan, uh, Private Eye. That's where that came from, was Pinkerton's uh, 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 illuminist eye. The Carbonari under Hugh Phillips, uh, Skull and Bones, for those of you who've studied that, uh, the man who started Skull and Bones was uh, William Russell. And William Russell was named a trustee of John Brown's will. Now, you won't find that in the modern histories of John Brown. You got to go back about 30 or 40 years to f start picking up on the fact in these, these histories of John Brown that William Russell helped finance John Brown and was one of the trustees of his will. Because the thing is, too many people have studied Skull and Bones today. And, and so if they saw this name connected to John Brown, a lot of eyebrows would go up and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And the Secret Six is usually the group of people that they claim were the ones behind John Brown. They were only part of it, believe me. And the Brotherhood of the Union, which was led by the Rosicrucian leader, uh, George Lepard. The Brotherhood of the Union was one of the most uh, influential organizations in the United States you've never heard of. I had never heard of it until I stumbled across it and I says, what is this? And then realized it was to be an umbrella group for all of these leftists. They're going to form an umbrella group to unite uh, towards doing certain things. Now, the interesting thing on this chart is these are the individuals and organizations that helped John Brown. Some of these people had to flee the United States after Harper's Ferry because they knew they could be tried for treason. None of them were. They only tried, and, and uh, those individuals found at Harper's Ferry, they let everybody else go. And some very big people were involved in the United States government doing all of this. Uh, newspapers. These newspapers, and this is just a few, actually had reporters writing with John Brown, participating in the murder and mayhem and arson, and writing back as uh, unbiased observers to the newspapers about this great saint called John Brown who's trying to free the slaves. And... Uh, you know, today we see things that are similar, don't we? For instance, we see video on, on TV where they'll go into a FARC uh, a training camp of terrorists in, in Colombia and show them, uh, you know, in, in their camps, getting trained and all the rest of it. But the Colombian government, for some reason or another, can't seem to find them. But this reporter can and come in and video them and then leave with the video. Whose side do you think that guy's on? He's not an unbiased observer, you see. He's kind of like the Mark Krasnowskis of the world and, and that sort of thing that I mentioned earlier. They have a bias, and, uh, but it doesn't show up in print all the time. And so these sorts of newspapers help propel this idea of this terrorist and what he was doing. And Southerners were reading these newspapers. They were saying, uh oh, this has gone too far. They literally want to kill us. That's what they're saying in some of this stuff. And, and the people behind John Brown are getting away with this. It's time for us to leave. And that's what caused them to secede. That's what finally met, uh, made the mass uh, population of the South to leave. Now, 
I don't want to leave the South alone without saying this one point. I concentrated on my book about the Northern aspect of the conspiracy because the North won the Civil War, right? So it had the major influence on the rest of the country. But we had these types of conspirators in the South. You'll see in my book very prominent individuals in the North and the South who called for the separation of the country into two parts. And as soon as it was separated, the agitators in the North became super patriots. We can't allow these people to leave. We've got to fight a war to keep them, uh, keep the, the union together and all that. And sometimes the speeches were made within 30 days of each other. It's incredible. In the South, it was a little bit different. They called for the separation, the secession. But as soon as the secession happened, they became obstructionists, preventing the South from winning the war within the Confederate government, within the state governments. For instance, Brown, who was the governor of Georgia when Sherman marched to the sea and on the way he burned Atlanta. Did you know he had 10,000 troops under his command and he dismissed them, told them to lay down their arms and go home before Sherman even marched into Georgia? After the war, Brown became one of the richest men in the South because he became an in-place carpetbagger. I mean, he started to take advantage of the reconstruction and buying up property, you know, cents on the dollar and everything else. The, the man was, was really bad. All that's in the book. And I've already mentioned this. We concentrate more on the conspiracy in the North simply because the North had more influence after the war uh, going forward. Now, one of the things that happened uh, in the war was a lot of the European communists came to the United States and became generals in the Union Army. For instance, Karl Wedemeyer was a personal friend of Karl Marx. Marx actually lived in his house for a time. He helped him form the First International. Same with August Willock, Karl Schurz, Frederick Annika, Gustav Paul Clazaret. In fact, Clazaret, five years after the conclusion of the Civil War, was the, what they called the Red General in Paris. When the communists took over Paris and started to slaughter the clergy, you know, the Archbishop of Paris and, and others to form a communist government in Paris. And, uh, and he, he was fresh from the Civil War. That's the kind of thing that was going on. There were 40 German radicals. I'm using the term radical rather than communist because some of them I can't absolutely prove were communists, uh, became generals in the Union Army. 78 others besides them were made generals uh, in the Union Army. And in the Confederate Army, they only had 10 foreign born. That's it. Whereas they had, uh, you know, 130 practically in the North. And, and it was a real serious problem. And uh, many of those men went on to become very important. Carl Schurz, for instance, is, is, we're in the state of Wisconsin right now. And in this state, he's a very famous individual because he came straight from communist revolutions in Europe into Wisconsin and was made a colonel in the militia and a trustee of the University of Wisconsin almost immediately and uh, became very important in, in the United States. Look him up. It's, uh, you can see how, he, how to spell his name. Uh, they won't tell you he was a communist, but just when you read it uh, and see what he was involved in, it will be amazing to you and uh, then start to research this guy. Go back in his, in, his, in his life and really spend some time. You will see he was always under communist orders. Uh, as from the time he was a student at the university and his main professor was a leader in the communist movement. But at any rate, uh, they, we, we document in the book the fact that many of these communists went into foreign service, uh, into the st uh, State Department. Uh, and uh, it was really quite a problem. And we're running out of time now, and I can't really get into some of the things that these men did in foreign service. Well, let me just end up on this one little note, just to give you one other example of an individual. One of the people that was, that was appointed by President Pierce as our counsel in Rome was George Sanders. George Sanders and the future President of the United States, James Buchanan, hosted a dinner for all these communist revolutionaries in London, whereat they uh, advocated throwing, uh, you know, overthrowing the governments of Europe and killing all the rulers. 
And they ended up the, uh, the, the banquet by singing the Marseille. And it was so uh, bad that when the Senate got wind of it, they would not confirm George Sanders as our uh, counsel in, in, uh, in London. When he came home, he gave a speech in New York, wherein he said that we need to have a revolution and reinstitute the guillotine. Only this time we need it driven by steam. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And that was the kind of guys that we were sending overseas. And I'd like to get into the Ostend Manifesto and other things to show these revolutionary involvement in these things. You'll find it all in my book. But again, I want to thank you for coming here tonight. I wish I could have expanded on each one of these points to uh, uh, an end in itself, but we just didn't have the time. I hope I've pricked your curiosity so that you will uh, read the book and you will go online and say, I, I just don't believe this. I, I just can't believe what I'm reading here. Uh, I'm going to research it for myself. Because one of the things that I wanted to do in my book was to stimulate others from their vantage point to do their own research and hopefully write more books in this early American history that we never learned in school. And I hope one day we will understand that a conspiracy does exist to tear down the United States. They've been working at it for over 230 years. They haven't been successful because of the layers of strength and morality within the American people and the fact that they fight each other. If they stop fighting each other, I, I, I hope that never happens because united, they are very strong and it would be difficult to stop them. But we have to stand up. We have to be uh, vigilant. We have to understand the Constitution and the principles on which it's founded. And we always have to keep in mind, we have to remain a moral people. Thank you very much.